Hello everybody, I'm Luca Pella and I'm a fascia manipulation certified therapist and teacher of the comparison between fascia manipulation and Chinese medicine. This video is a translation of a webinar held by Luigi Stecco on the 1st of December 2021 about the biomechanics of the paravertebral and prevertebral ganglia and so about the system and the fourth level of fascia manipulation. The first level is a reflex therapy. In the previous webinar, we analyzed the peristalsis therapy, that is the treatment of the intra and extramural vegetative ganglia and the, their connection with the peristalsis and the musculoskeletal system. And we analyzed all the connections that can be made from the external of our body and the internal part. In this webinar, instead, we will analyze the reflexotherapy. It has the treatment of dysfunction of the external and internal system through the microscopic vegetative system formed by the paravertebral ganglia, which are connected to the superficial fascia, and so the external system, and so we will see the cutaneous, the adipose, and the lymphatic system, and then the prevertebral ganglia united with the internal system. So we are talking about the thermoregulatory system, metabolic system, and the immune system. The vegetative nerves, which connect the central system, both pons, hypothalamus, to the intramural ganglia and the prevertebral ganglia. So we will see how we can act on this ganglia and on this structure. Obviously, we don't act in a direct way on these ganglions and nerves because they are protected inside the body, but we can act through a kind of uh, antenna, which is the superficial fascia, with the aim to change the information for the autonomic nervous system and so its response. This kind of uh, uh, use of the superficial fascia is uh, uh, really ancient. The same concept has been used by acupuncture, as we can see in this picture from the book of the Quirico. And uh, it has been used uh, from uh, for thousands of years from acupuncture. We can mention, as it is in the picture, the back shoe points and the anterior move points of the acupuncture that are in relationship with the paravertebral ganglia, obviously. And these ganglia are in relationship with internal organs, but not directly. They are most of all in relationship with the superficial fascia because they uh, can manage the vascularization of the superficial fascia. We will see later how these ganglia will uh, connect with the organs. But before that, we have to analyze what we know about the vegetative nervous system for the classical medicine. So the description is uh, directly from Eustachio. And we can see here, it is reported by Kerugi. We are talking about uh, this statement that Eustachio made almost 500 years ago. So he thinks that the autonomous nervous system is formed from the orthosympathetic system, which includes the paravertebral ganglia. Para means uh, side, right side away from the vertebral column, and then the prevertebral ganglia. The pre means in front of the vertebral bones. Then there is the parasympathetic system, which is formed uh, mainly by the vagus nerve, about 90% from the vagus nerve. So we see this clear distinction, and we see that all the, all the ganglia, both the paravertebral ganglia and the prevertebral ganglia, in this uh, uh, conception are thought of, um, of uh, uh, being orthosympathetic, but we will see it is not uh, really accurate. Then uh, in this kind of division, we see there is a big difference, a big imbalance. And uh, uh, we can see that there is only one nerve almost that uh, uh, handle all the parasympathetic information. Instead, all the other nerves and ganglia are related to the sympathetic uh, function. So this is a little strange. And uh, we will see uh, these two systems are not really antagonists as they are always described, but uh, they are most uh, all uh, cooperative from, uh, on each other. 
and we will see that this description is a, a little not so true. So many other authors think something is wrong in this kind of description. Here we can see a, a statement from Bortolami, and he says that the paravertebral ganglia are not orthosympathetic. So also already this statement uh, is uh, directly the contrary of what uh, Chiarugi said reporting Eustachio statement. And uh, Bortolami says that uh, the, the paravertebral ganglia are not orthosympathetic, but they are polymodal. They are polymodal vegetative ganglia because from this ganglia, both cholinergic and adrenergic impulses depart from them. For, uh, and they depart and go to the hypodermis. So we can see that uh, from this column that usually we think it is only orthosympathetic, the part uh, uh, both cholinergic impulses and the cholinergic is more related to the parasympathetic stimulation and adrenergic uh, impulses that are more related to the orthosympathetic stimulation. So they are all connected with the, the, spinal, ner the spinal nerves and they are directed to the superficial fascia, the glandular system of the superficial fascia, like the sweet gland, and the visceral tissue and vascular tissue that are in the superficial fascia. So they go to the spinal nerves and uh, make the vegetative part of these nerves. Then we have uh, another statement of Benningoff that say that the splanchic nerves pass the, the, par the paravertebral ganglia without making synapses and terminate in the vessels, kidneys, and celiac ganglion. So uh, we have to distinguish between the real peripher peripheral action of this ganglia and the splanking nerves that goes from the ganglia, but without making synapsy with them. So they have the same pathway of other nerves, but different the function. As we can see, there is a some other uh, inaccurate information in uh, the conception of the autonomic nervous system. And uh, some authors uh, says that uh, the paravertebral ganglia are not really all what we consider them. It means that uh, like uh, the cervical ganglia and the stellate one are not just paravertebral. These ganglia usually are connected with the paravertebral chain because um, of, their, of their position. Their anatomical position is similar to the one of the parasympathetic uh, chain. Uh, no, sorry, not parasympathetic, but paravertebral chain. And so because of their position, their anatomical position, usually they are considered as part of the uh, paravertebral chain, and so they are considered to be orthosympathetic. But the cervical and upper thoracic orthosympathetic ganglia, despite being paravertebral from a topographical point of view, are partially paravertebral and partially prevertebral in function. So they, uh, uh, they work in a different way from the paravertebral ganglia. They work like the prevertebral ganglia, and we will see later what does it mean. The superior cervical ganglion is in anastomosis with some encephalic nerves, that is with the glossopharyngeal, with the vagus, and with the hypoglossal. So here Chiarugi says that this, uh, this ganglion, the superior cervical ganglion in mainly, is in connection with the vagus nerve and uh, glossopharyngeal and with the hypoglossal. So they are a different way of uh, working. They, they work like the prevertebral ganglia because they are in connection with these kind of nerves. So the different is more in the function. And uh, these ganglia are more in relation with the, the internal system than, from, than to the external one. 
the prevertebral ganglia so are not orthosympathetic. We have, as you remember in the, the statement of uh, Eustachio, the prevertebral and the paravertebral ganglia were both uh, connected with the sympathetic or orthosympathetic function. But as, ben as Benningoff said, they are not. The celiac ganglion is formed by the nerve fibers of the splanking nerve, vagus nerve, and the right phrenic nerve. From the celiac ganglion, nerve fibers radiate like the rays of the sun, which form the solar plexus. So, all, uh, if all these fibers in contact, uh, all these fibers are in contact with the ganglion, is not possible for the celiac ganglion to be only sympathetic. If it is only sympathetic, there will be not so much connection with the ganglion, with the nerves like the vagus and all the other uh, autonomic nerves. But these structures are more likely to be a sorting station. So uh, the prevertebral ganglia uh, works more like a sorting station. They receive inputs from uh, the other nerves and then they um, make the other impulses to go to the organs. And we will see how it works later on. But they are not clearly or the sympathetic or parasympathetic. They are more uh, really a kind of a sorting station. So they receive lots of kind of impulses, both parasympathetic and orthosympathetic, and then decide what to do. So they work like a kind of a mini brain uh, near the organs. In this picture, there is a also another writing that is not accurate, and this is the denomination of the celiac plexus here, because uh, this is not the celiac plexus, because the plexus, as Benningoff said, is the radiation of the nerve's fibers from the ganglia. So is the ramification that departs from the ganglia and not the ganglia themselves, which are, uh, accumulation of ne neurovegetative neurons. So we have the ganglia that are accumulation of neurovegetative neurons. And from the ganglia, there are many branches of nerves that comes out and those fibers creates the plexuses. So uh, parasympathetic nerves arrive in each ganglion. So they are not only orthosympathetic. This is really important to understand because uh, uh, this is another kind of um, distinction from the um, statement of Eustachio. And uh, it's important to understand that the parasympathetic nerves arrive in each ganglion, so the ganglion cannot be only orthosympathetic. So what are the paravertebral ganglia for? They are uh, also a kind of sorting station of all the impulses derived from the lateral column of the spinal cord and from proximal and distal ganglia. The paravertebral ganglia will send the vegetative fibers to the spinal nerve through the gray communicant branches. And there will be three different impulses because they have to send signals from arteries, hair and sweet glands. And this is depending on temperature. So mainly they are involved in temperature and temperature regulation from the outside. So they can open and close the vascularization of the superficial part in order to uh, let the heat go out or in order to contain the heat of our body. So these are like peripheral brains that can coordinate different kinds of impulses. <clears throat> And what about the prevertebral ganglia? So what are the prevertebral ganglia for? They are mainly connected to the internal system. And first of all, also in this picture, there is something not completely accurate. Into the mediastinum here, they are not drawn the prevertebral ganglia because they are considered as part of paravertebral ganglia. But we can see there is the cardiac ganglion here which is the extramural ganglia that coordinates the vascular organofascial units of the thorax. 
then we can see the gastric ganglion here uh, for visceral organofascial units of the lumbar region and so on. Beside the major ganglia, which are more related to the system, there are also the extramural ganglia for each uh, organofascial units, as we discussed in the last webinar. So the prevertebral ganglia manage the vegetative system and, and function of the internal system. So each one, like the celiac ganglia, the renal ganglia, the superior mesenteric, are more related to the thermoregulatory, metabolic, and the immune system. In each body cavity, there is a prevertebral ganglion that manages the function of the internal system. Then there are specific extramural microscopic ganglia for the peristalsis of each unit, uh, such as the cardiac, the renal ganglion, etc. Then there is a, a synergy between the prevertebral ganglia and the paravertebral ganglia. So they are two kinds of peripheral brain. As you can see here, they have a, a kind of a synergy for working on the organ itself. We can find the paravertebral ganglia also in primitive animals, while the prevertebral ganglia are new kind of structure which arrived when the animal body had to control more system, particularly when heterothermal and homothermal animals uh, are needed to change their uh, uh, behavior in a, in a way of survival. So uh, the homothermal animals compared and needed this ganglion in order to handle the blood flow. Mammals, only mammals and birds have prevertebral ganglia. The prevertebral one are present only in mammals and birds. And these are also important for the immune system, particularly for the adaptive immune system, which is present only in mammals. So these, can, these ganglia are not uh, every, in every animals because uh, they are not in needed. When an animal does not need to uh, change all the behavior of their system, they can, uh, they can handle the thermoregulation by the, only the paravertebral ganglia. But if we have to regulate in a better way our homeostasis, the prevertebral ganglia are more important. So uh, um, mammals and birds developed this kind of uh, ganglia. So uh, we can find, we can differentiate these two ganglia in this way. The paravertebral ganglia are more in relationship with the superficial fascia, and so with the cutaneous adipose and lymphatic system that are more external. We can find them into the fish or uh, chameleon and all animals uh, that have them. Uh, particularly if we consider chameleon, uh, he can change the color of uh, the skin, thank you to the paravertebral ganglia. The prevertebral ganglia instead are more related to the internal system. So they are more relation uh, with the thermoregulatory system, the metabolic system and the immune system. And they are related to each cavity of the body and they connect to the extramural ganglia. So they connect with the kind of accumulator we saw in the last webinar that coordinate the, uh, the organs themselves. Then we can see, as we said in the beginning of this webinar, there are not two antagonist nerves, but three vegetative nerves. So this is a part that is not really simple. So I repeat this. We, are, we have not two antagonist nerves, so we have not two antagonist system, but in reality, we have three vegetative nerves. Until now, an autonomic nervous system has always been seen in antagonism way. So we, all, we always see parasympathetic is uh, the enemy, almost, of orthosympathetic. So uh, this way uh, is not always, uh, in, uh, not always works to understand our body. So really, uh, there are three types of nerves 
that uh, uh, help us to coordinate the autonomic nervous system. And uh, uh, the splanking nerve, the vagus nerve, and the phrenic nerve. The splanking nerve, as I already said, do not make synapses with the paravertebral ganglia, but they go to the organ. Saladin says that a double innervation is not always necessary to have opposite effect on an organ. The vasoconstriction, for instance, occurs due to a high nerve discharge, and vasodilatation occurs due to a reduced discharge. So, uh, in order to coordinate uh, the, the blood flow, it's not necessary that we have one system that uh, do the vasoconstriction and another one that do uh, the vasodilatation. It is sufficient that uh, there is only one system for uh, the vasoconstriction, and when it, this system uh, discharge, then the vaso vasoconstriction, and when the um, uh, the system do not uh, discharge anymore or uh, less uh, discharge, then the vessel open up. So uh, also in this case, it's not really necessary to have uh, two different and uh, two uh, antagonist system. They can work in a different way, just as a, a kind of modulation of the signal. So it is not like the one is inhibition and the other one is stimulation, also because a nerve always gives impulses. It is not so easy to understand how a nerve could, be, could give an impulse to inhibit uh, something. So it's just that uh, where is necessary, sympathetic system just improve the function, like the heart when it's necessary to increase the rhythm. The same happens with the vagus in the intestine. When it's necessary, the vagus nerve gives impulse in order to make the intestine work more. Or it slows down the impulses in, and the, the intestine will have its own peristalsis uh, regulated by the intramural ganglia, as we saw in the other webinar. So why we have a third nerve that is always not considered and only related to the diaphragm? The phrenic nerve has, in fact, two nucleus one is more related to the motor function and is more obviously in connection with the diaphragm. And the other one is more vegetative. So the phrenic nerve and the adenosympathetic and adenosympathetic system. The vegetative part of the phrenic nerve goes to the solar plexus and also in the celiac region, cervical, first thoracic, and so on. All these connections tell us that its vegetative component is really important. Also, Berlinder in uh, 2018 said that the phren all the phrenic nerves of the 35 cadavers contained catecholaminergic fibers, which were distributed homogeneously or as a single fascicle to the, to the celiac plexus. So the nerves from a phrenic ganglia goes under the diaphragm and participate to the other ganglia, like the adrenal one. It seems that the anatomists knew that uh, its function is also vegetative, but they didn't know how to fit it inside the autonomic nervous theory and it, as it was before. Because if we consider the theory of autonomic nervous system as it was uh, in a Stachio statement with the two uh, antagonists. Uh, so we don't understand why uh, a nerve like the phrenic one has uh, some um, vegetative fibers in it and it participates to the innervation of a, a prevertebral ganglia. If we stand with that kind of uh, conception, we don't understand why these nerves have uh, this kind of uh, fibers. And so, like Chiarucci said, the phrenic nerve contracts anastomosis with the inferior cervical ganglia and with the celiac ganglia. The nerves are all cholinergic. So three different nerves are needed to activate the vessels, fat, or glands. <clears throat> all the three kinds of nerves are cholinergic. 
So how would they work if they all bring the same chemical mediator? But if we look at where they depart and where they go, we can understand better how the whole system works. So we are gonna look at it in a few minutes. So why three different nerves? Also in fish like trout, we see three apparatus fascial sequences. We can see the visceral sequences that is enveloped by the peritoneum. Then there is the vascular in the retroperitoneal area. And then there is the glandular uh, sequence that is connected to the diaphragm. And from the diaphragm is joined to the pericardium, the gonads and liver. Liver particularly is uh, uh, usually considered intraperitoneal, but if we look uh, clearly at the anatomy, we can see that uh, uh, the liver is extraperitoneal because it is a gland. And so it is not involved in the peritoneum. The peritoneum uh, take uh, the liver apart from it. It involves the liver in order to uh, isolate it from the peritoneal cavity. In humans and in other animals, the peritoneum isolates the liver. So in this way, we have a clear separation of the free internal sequences. So for free sequences, we need three different stimulus. So at the level of the brain stems, we have centers that control the heart, the breathing, and the appetite. So the free nerves come from there. And that has been important in our evolution because the animals that have been more, like, more likely to survive have been the one who could prepare for action. So if the control of our uh, autonomic nervous system is in the brain, we can understand that uh, when we see a danger, we can prepare our body in order to front this kind of danger. And, uh, if we can prepare the body so we can understand how it works when we see a, a tiger, for instance, <clears throat> then our heartbeat starts to rise up because uh, we know we are in danger. So we start to prepare the body to run and to escape. Also, if uh, there is not action still. So in this way, we can have a better chance to survive. And we have to regulate our system in order to answer to the world. So the, our brain has uh, the teleceptors like the eyes, the nose, mouth, and the ears in order to feel what happens outside and to prepare our body. Uh, thank you to this uh, connection. Uh, when we see a horror movie, we can feel the terror only by the music that is held or by the, the sounds that uh, we can see, we can hear into the, into the film. In this way, we prepare our body to a danger, in, also if the danger is only uh, in the film. In this image, we can see how vagus nerves connect with the intramural ganglia of larynx, esophagus, stomach, and intestine. So it stimulates the visceral organs. And so the vagus nerve is more related with the visceral sequence. Instead, the splanking nerve with the orthosympathetic impulses increase the circulation and goes and the nerves from the Splanking nerves goes to the vessel, to the heart, to the kidneys, and to the bladder. And so the stimulation is for the vascular sequence. Instead, the phrenic nerves <coughs> is a adenosympathetic. So it's a kind of autonomic uh, impulse that goes more on the glands of our body. And so it increases the glandular function. So it's more related to the glandular sequence. <coughs> This is already said from many authors. Gray said the cardiac nerves from cardiac plexuses are mostly sympathetic. The nerves to the cardiac plexus 
are mostly orthosympathetic. The distribution of the vagus, unlike uh, that of the sympathetic, is limited to the visceral structures. This is from Chusset. So <clears throat> the excitation of the nerves from the viscera is parasympathetic. Of the vessel is orthosympathetic, and of the gland, it is adenosympathetic. So glands are not considered, but they have innervation, and this innervation is adenosympathetic. Here in this picture, we don't see the glands, so there is not the connection with the phrenic nerve. But there is this difference, and the, the visceral uh, sequence is more in relationship, in relationship with the vagus nerve, and instead the vascular system, the vascular sequence is more in relation with the uh, splanking nerves, and so the orthosympathetic. Sorry. Uh, yes. Then we can deepen our understanding considering the centers that we find into the brainstem. Some of them are present also into preventive animals. Heterotherm animals form the new centers of for the thermoregulation into the thalamus and sympathetic and parasympathetic center. Para, some fibers contained with vagus and with it go to the visceral sequence to the stimulate the apparatuses. So from the parasympathetic centers, these fibers go to the fibers, to, to the nucleus of the vagus, and then go to stimulate the apparatuses, mainly the visceral one. Then from the sympathetic centers, fibers <coughs> go down to connect with the thoracic sympathetic center and so stimulate the immune system also. The, from the phrenic nerves, goes down and stimulate the thermoregulation. So from the thermoregulation center here, uh, there, is, there are fibers that goes down and connect with the uh, nucleus of the um, phrenic nerves. And then from that, they stimulate the glands. So we see that all free nerves have two kinds of stimuli. One more ancient, which comes from hypothalamus, bulb, and brain stems, and it goes from to the intramural ganglia. Then we have another wave of fibers that go directly of prevertebral ganglia, which will distribute in different way that stimulus to the organs. We can explain better with this image from hypothalamus, center, ner center nervous system. So arrives the free autonomic nerves with all cholinergic stimulus. And they arrive to the pre-vertebral ganglia. At the level of the ganglion, only specific cells, we can consider this one from the splank, splank, mm, from the splanking nerves, only uh, some kind of uh, neurons inside the ganglion are stimulated and they are a specific ganglion. So if a sympathetic stimulus comes in and gives the impulse to a, a precise kind of neurons, which will distribute their answer to the other neurological plexus. We know that every nerve which enters the ganglion gives rise to at least 30 nerve fibers that form a plexus. If we assume that this uh, is the celiac ganglion, the, ex the, ex the, the, the fibers that uh, go out from the ganglion will go to stimulate the extramural ganglia of each organ. So the sympathetic signal will go to stimulate vessel and heart and vascular sequence. The stimulation is in accordance to hypothalamus program, obviously. So the central nervous system, hypothalamus and brainstem, decide what to do, and they give the order through the <coughs> free vegetative nerves, so splanking nerve, vagus nerve, phrenic nerve, to the prevertebral ganglia. And uh, these are all cholinergic impulses, so of activation. And uh, in the ganglion, there are 
specific population of neurons that are stimulated by each nerve, and they will uh, uh, perform another kind of uh, answer depending on the stimulus they, they add. <clears throat> so in conclusion, every organ receive uh, at least five vegetative inputs from the vegetative nervous system. So we have the intramural, that is the metasympathetic, uh, that is a, a really network, a real network that is around the, the organ itself. Then there is the extramural, that is for the synchrony of the organofascia units. And we talk about these kind of impulses in the peristalsis therapy. So in the third level that we discussed in the last webinar. And then we can see there are archaic fibers of the nerves of the brainstem for the uh, apparatus fascial sequences. Then there are more recent nerve fibers from the hypothalamus uh, for, to the um, pervertebral ganglia and fibers from the paravertebral ganglia joined to the superficial fascia. But we can, to understand better this concept, we have to consider how the superficial fascia is made. So, and to understand this, we can understand better how we can act on the paravertebral ganglia. So the superficial fascia, uh, we can see here uh, a slide of it. And here we can see there is a, a cutaneous nerve and these nerves are always represented as a perceptive nerve. So usually uh, they are considered as only as receptors that um, only inform our, us on what happens on the skin. So uh, pressure uh, and other kinds of stimuli so like uh, heat, cold, and so on. But these nerves have more than 70% of vegetative fibers and only 30% of the nerve is receptive. So we can see in the superficial fascia, we have all the free superficial system. And uh, these are um, stimulated just by the cutaneous nerve. And the superficial system are the cutaneous. So we talk about a dermatome. Then we have adipose system. So we have adiposome. Then we have lymphatic and blood vessels. So we have the hydrosome. Through the manipulation of uh, the superficial fascia, we can change the vascularization of all these parts. And so we can change how the system perceive this kind of uh, vascularization. And so there will be a different answer. <clears throat> now, we are not interested in this kind of relationship uh, Saladin says that the brain cannot distinguish the precision of different uh, uh, afferent from uh, the body. So in uh, Luigi's opinion, this does, not, this does not seem to be realistic because brain has a really precise and efficient perception of all the body. And it, uh, this is important for the survivor of our body. Also, other kind of theory like this is not really understandable. We pass from a big, time of, big type of correspondence, as the picture before, to the tiny little ones of the Jericho and head. If we consider the connection of superficial fascia with the paravertebral ganglia, and that um, paravertebral ganglia are not directly connected to the organs, but uh, they are connected with the prevertebral ganglia, and from then we go uh, to the organs. It's difficult to think that uh, from superficial fascia we can influence in such a precise way uh, the internal organs. If we can see uh, from the Jaricot, uh, we can uh, have a, a, an influence on the stomach or pancreas in this little spot here. <clears throat> there can be. Uh, action on the autonomic nervous system, but uh, as 
the innervation of this part is made by the paravertebral ganglia and the paravertebral ganglia are not directly connected to the organs, but they are um, connected with the prevertebral ganglia and then the prevertebral ganglia will, uh, connect, will connect it to the system and to the organs. So it's not possible in our opinion to um, take a, a, um, a clear stimulation to a precise organ from uh, this uh, little spot on the superficial fascia. It must be a, a different way. So it's more easy to understand how it works with the reflex therapy, because uh, we can have a more general effect. If we stimulate the superficial fascia and we stimulate the most uh, uh, hardness point of the superficial fascia, we can change how the brain uh, perceives it and how the brain uh, uh, gives the, the answer to this uh, stimulation. So for fascia manipulation, we can have a reflected pain and a reflected dysfunction. If superficial fascia is involved, we don't have a clear pain, but more an alteration of the skin, capillaries, etc., and some discomfort mainly on uh, the skin. So maybe not a clear pain, but a more a, a sense of discomfort of the skin. Also treatment can change and uh, the treatment, the way of treatment have to change because uh, when we uh, talk about superficial fascia, we have to differentiate also our kind of manipulation. So uh, it's different from the musculoskeletal system. For pain related to the catenaries, we work on them and on the tensile structure as we talk about uh, in the last webinar. With the... Uh, uh, superficial fascia, we also change the way of manipulating it. So for instance, if we take the adipose system, we can treat the adipose part that is more rigid in order to give a stimuli to the part which give different impulses to the related organs through prevertebral pre ganglia. So if we think there is a, a more rigid part of the superficial fascia, this part will uh, lead to the nervous system a different kind of uh, uh, stimulation because it is more rigid. So it gives a different kind of a sensation. If we change this sensation, the brain have a different interpretation of the superficial fascia and so, for instance, of the adipose system and can change the way it behaves. <clears throat> the same on the other system, obviously, uh, when uh, we treat the, the lymphatic knee, uh, system and uh, uh, the vascular system, uh, the superficial vascular system, we change uh, the mobilization because uh, uh, we need more to mobilize the angiosome and less to treat the rigid part of the adipose system. With the cutaneous system, instead, uh, we can manipulate the points where the cutaneous nerve emerges. And so we have to understand the quadrants and uh, uh, how they work with each other. So uh, we have lots of different ways to stimulate the system in order to change the way it answered to our uh, manipulation. And so in order to change the answer to the environment. So thank you if you're listening to this uh, translation and uh, see you next year with the Steco webinar. Bye-bye.